In this final lecture of today, we are going to talk about the application of likelihoods in phylogenetic comparative analyses. Now, you've already heard about likelihood when uh, Vincent and Hector were talking about it, and that is indeed the same concept. But we are now going to look at it from a slightly different perspective, not uh, to build trees with it, but to uh, look at how uh, character states behave on a given tree shape or maybe on a couple of tree shapes that you are comparing with one another. So we are now talking about not continuous valued traits but uh, discrete traits and uh, you probably heard about likelihood in the context of using molecular data now that is just a special form of categorical data just with four states a c g and t but obviously uh, other categorical data exists as well that has different discrete states such as the different uh, pollinators that might interact with a plant for example so when we are talking about discrete categorical data and so this also includes uh, DNA sequences then obviously we require different approaches than what we've heard about so far like independent contrasts or generalized uh, least squares uh, and so there's various ways in which you can treat these discrete data and one of these you also have already heard uh, about, uh, that's maximum parsimony. So maximum parsimony is kind of a, a uh, simple assumption about how uh, discrete characters evolve. We basically assume that these changes are just super duper rare. Um, and so then we can plot these changes under maximum parsimony on a tree. And then we might uh, do things such as look at, well, where are those changes concentrated on a tree? Let's say if we have multiple discrete characters, so multiple columns in a character state matrix, then we might want to look at whether those coincide or near each other on a tree, or maybe whether one precedes the other uh, under maximum parsimony. But we might want to get a little bit more explicit about our assumptions for how evolution works, not simply by saying, oh, well, it must be very rare, but maybe we want to actually model how these state transitions happen so that we can maybe test different hypotheses about them. And this brings us to these uh, continuous time Markov models. And that may, might sound a little scary, but it is uh, basically to do with a concept we've also seen already or at least I assume you've seen this, namely the rate matrix, which is often called Q. And you might have seen this within the context of molecular evolution, where you have basically a four by four matrix, where you put in the rates for any type of molecular substitution. And there might be substitution classes, such as, you know, uh, do the purines A and G, uh, substitute at a different rate among them than the uh, primidines uh, C and T and is there then for example a rate ratio between transitions and transfers and that sort of stuff that is one uh, application of these specifically for molecular data but we can have other types of data with other numbers of states and the simplest example of that is shown here so now we have a character that has just two states, i and j. And so then we can explicitly say, OK, how do we think uh, uh, i changes into j and j changes into i? So then we get basically a two by two matrix where we might say, well, the transition rate for going from an i to a j is a q i j. So that is the... Uh, uh, cell on the top right uh, or we can also say the opposite well uh, what's the rate for going from a j to a i well that might be q j i now 
as these transitions, uh, well, they either happen or they don't. So every row um, must sum to one, right? Uh, it either happens or it doesn't. So in total, that's like a probability of one. So for the other cells, uh, we can just do one minus. And of course, as the matrix gets, uh, gets more complicated, as we add more states, then uh, we might do this a little bit more a little bit differently but they still have to sum to one and we'll see an example of that later on now if we've defined a model like that then and we have our data and we have our tree well then we can go and calculate the likelihood of the data in the tree so that is basically with this machine so this uh, might look a little complicated but we'll get there so in the uh, bottom right there is an, an instance of the likelihood formula and um, we again see some uh, greek symbols and uh, remember how the sigma was the sum and the great big pi is like the product um, and so what is happening here well let's just look at one of the color coded terms in the equation so for example the uh, one that is underlined in red so that says the probability just in general one of these terms is the probability that the branch beginning in state i ends in state j after time period t and in this particular case so that's the probability of a branch starting at whatever is the state at node 9, the root, uh, then uh, uh, changing into whatever is the state at node 8 along branch length T8. So I said twice, well, whatever the state is, well, in both cases, the state the state can be 0 or 1 so the state at the root can be 0 or 1 the state at node 8 can be 0 or 1 and so then these constructs with the sigmas basically just iterate through okay let's say that node 9 has a 0 so that's the first sum there and then okay let's say if that has 1 um, but then we do all permutations so we say well let's say if node zero uh, node nine is uh, the root is zero and uh, node eight is zero or node uh, nine is one and node eight is zero or node nine, nine is one and uh, node eight is one and so on and so on so this this goes through all possibilities and that's basically what that construct there shows so it needs to consider all these possibilities for all the interior branches. So that is the uh, red and the yellow and the orange branch. But it does not have to consider all possibilities for the terminal branches because they're on one end of the branch, namely the end that's the tip there we actually know what the state is so consider for example the uh, turquoise branch so that's the branch that leads from the node labeled with seven to the rightmost terminal which is labeled uh, with uh, five um, well there we have to consider what the state is might be at the interior node seven so that is uh, one in that list of the sigmas but not at the tip because at the tip it's just defined isn't it right so we go over all of these uh, combinations uh, on the inside like on the interior nodes of the tree uh, we do that for one character character x and we also do that for another character character y and then we take the product of those so because we are multiplying a whole bunch of now probabilities, then uh, in the end we are going to end up with a very, very small number, aren't we? Because we're multiplying numbers smaller than one, larger than zero, smaller than one. So it ends up being a very small number. Um, so a, a 
pretty common convention is to then take the log of that and so then actually the log will you know once once it's log transformed then the uh, smallest number is actually something that started out being the biggest number was log transformed so the smallest number is sort of the best likelihood isn't it so that's how that's done and uh, so that is both done for tree inference so there we uh, just change the shape of the tree and then for each different sh tree shape we do this but we can also do this for uh, characters and then we can for example uh, uh, look at how characters are correlated with one another and uh, I'll show you an example in a minute of that. But these are the mechanics of, uh, of the likelihood function sort of in, in very abstract terms and you can imagine that there's a lot a lot of uh, calculations involved in this because a lot of things need to be you know, uh, multiplied with one another, a lot of different scenarios have to be considered and now over time actually um, some uh, clever shortcuts have been developed for this. Um, so one of them is that we actually don't just brute force work from the root to the tips, but kind of in the opposite direction. We work from the tips down and we kind of carry over our intermediate results. And um, that is yet another thing that's been contributed to the field by the big pioneer uh, Joe Felsenstein, who first implemented that in Filip and then from there it ended up, for example, in uh, RexML and in uh, also other uh, R packages that do uh, phylogenetic comparative methods. So that's the pruning algorithm of Felsenstein, which you might come across in the literature. So just a quick recap on the terminology. Uh, now, we express things in probabilities when we're talking about, well, what is the plausibility of some outcome given some set of parameter values. And then the likelihood is something that then describes what we actually got out of it once we looked at the data. So in uh, you know common parlance, uh, we use probability and likelihood interchangeably, but not here. So these are different things. Um, now, what can we do with the likelihood framework? Well, we can uh, search for trees, we can test different hypotheses, um, and in each case, we normally, using the likelihood function, get a point estimate, so a single value. So how does this then uh, differ from uh, Bayesian methods? Well, there we might still use the same function, but then we uh, consider uh, many more scenarios and basically as a way to express our uncertainty. Now, finally, how does this then work when we do comparative studies? Well, that uh, is, uh, well, here's an example. Let's say, okay, so here we now have our two characters, X and Y, and we now basically make all permutations among them. So every uh, row is one of those uh, combinations. So the first row is, well, both state X and state character X and character Y have state zero. The second row, character X is 0, Y is 1. The third row, the, the opposite, um, X is 1, Y is 0. And then in the fourth row, X and Y are both state 1. And the same for the columns. So now, basically, you could say, well, we're just treating these combinations of states as if they are a new state. So this almost starts to look like a um, substitution matrix when we have four states, doesn't it? Except, so now we can use this to um, include some of our, you know, clever hypotheses that we might have about our characters. So, for example, uh, you might notice that in the uh, 
top rightmost cell, we are looking at a, a transition where we go from 0, 0, so character X, 0, character Y, 0, and then that cell says, well, what would be the instantaneous transition rate where both at the same time switch to 1? Well, that seems uh, very improbable, so we might there put a rate of 0. We disallow it. Then for the uh, transitions where we go from 0, 0 to 0, 1, we might have a, a rate uh, Q1, 2, and from 0, 0 to 1, 0, we might have a rate for Q1, 3. So I'm now looking at the cells in the top row, the middle two cells. Um, and you can imagine that, for example, here we might have scenarios where we uh, play around with, well, are we allowing, are these symmetrical? So is going from 0, 0 to 0, 1, is that the same as from going as going from 1, 0 to 0, 0? In this case, there are distinct rates assigned to this, but of course you might link those or you might use separate parameters for them. And uh, you can see, and so for example, one thing that you might do here is say, well, I uh, hypothesize that um, with these two characters, character X is first going to transition. So we go from 0, 0 to 1, 0. And only then from 1, 0, we are uh, allowed to go to 1, 1. So only one uh, can go first and then the other follows. And the opposite, we disallow. So then the rate 0, 0, 0, 1 would be disallowed. Now that might then fit your data less good, um, but then comes the trick where we compute the likelihoods of the different scenarios and uh, compare them and see how well they fit the data. And then we might impose further penalties for the amounts of parameters that we use. So we might do something like uh, an, a K-key information criterion or something like that. Um, we don't have to go into the mechanics right now, but suffice it to say that if we are explicit about these different rates, then we can tinker with them and we can set up clever paths through this rate matrix to see what, what we allow and what do we disallow. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, each row has to sum to one. So you can see that along the diagonal, um, we have just a term that says one minus n, the sum of these two uh, free parameters and not the one that's set to zero because, well, it's just zero, right? So that's how we play around with these uh, matrices to test uh, different hypotheses for uh, character state changes under likelihoods. So just to wrap up, uh, we can use the, the likelihood function for a whole bunch of different things. So we can use it for uh, comparing tree shapes and then picking basically the best tree shape. Uh, so for phylogenetic inference, we can also uh, use this to play around with the Q matrix, such as I, uh, I mentioned. Uh, but we can also do other things such as uh, play around with the branch lengths on the tree. You might remember in the great big function that there was also these uh, stretches of time were being considered. So obviously we can then just change the distribution of branch lengths on the tree, for example, forcing it to be ultrametric. And then we can see what kind of likelihood we get out of that and whether we can, uh, you know, sort of accept a molecular clock in the sense that it's not going to fit our data as good, but maybe still good enough. So for that, we also use likelihood. Thank you for listening.